If you want to make Entity Framework Core faster, you might want to check out DB Context Pooling. Let's mash on that. Hi everybody, and welcome to another episode of the ASP Net Monsters. In today's episode, we're going to talk about DB Context Pooling. I have no idea what that is. Tell me more. All right, well, this is, as has been the theme lately, a new feature in Entity Framework Core 2.0 and it's one that's designed entirely around performance. So normally what happens here in, a, in an ASP.NET app when we add a DB context, I'm using my trusty old employee context here, um, any controller or any page that requires a DB con that DB context, when the request comes in, it will create a, single, a new instance of the DB context and it will live for the lifetime of the request and then when the request is over, that DB context will be disposed completely. And that's pretty fast. Like it, it's not super costly to create a DB context, but there's a whole graph of things that DB context requires or relies on with all the entity framework services. So there's some work involved in wiring it all up and getting it all right. Um, so what they were looking at doing is instead of creating a new DB context every single time is that they would have a pool of DB contexts available. So there's you know, a set of however many of them available. And instead of disposing it completely, what it does is just returns it to that, that pool after and kind of resets it to a default state. And then next time you need a DB context for the next request, it gives you, instead of a brand new one, it gives you kind of a recycled one that was already created but reset to a default state. So that's that's kind of the general theory behind it. And I was watching an episode on or a, one of the presentations with .NET Conf a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about it there, and they showed some demos of just the raw performance of it, so in terms of how many DB contexts they can create in a second, which is uh, not like a real world scenario, but uh, on their little test, it was they could create about 6,500 DB contexts per second using the usual approach. So the way a standard application is wired up the way we have here with just add DB context. And then I have a page here uh, where I'm injecting the employee context into it. So they're able to create about 6,500 per second. And then they were when they enabled DB context pooling, they were able to create uh, 9,300 per second on average. So an improvement, but creating the DB context is a small portion of what happens when a page request needs to be processed. So I wanted to look at it in a, a little bit more of a real world scenario. So what I did here is just a very simple app. I'll just fire it up here. All it does is just lists out uh, I think all the, oh, it's doing a light query. So this is recycling from my example from the last episode. Uh, but it's just doing a light query on a list of employees, a table of employees and listing them out here. So there's, there's not a whole lot going on, but I'm just gonna run this without the debugger attached. And I'm gonna use a, a little simple on a web page load testing app here. I'll, I'll do four threads for 20 seconds. And I'm basically just gonna see how many times I can request that page. So this isn't a great example of a, a load test here because everything's running locally. And uh, I'm also recording on the same machine at the same time. So there's a lot going on, but it should give us at least an idea of what's happening. So after but 20 if I, if I start to move back and forth quickly, changing a lot of pixels, increasing the encoding load on your computer, yeah. it's going to slow it down. Right? So I should stay as still as possible. Well, no, what you have to do is move the exact same amount for the next test. <laughs> okay, so using the standard, uh, the standard approach where we're creating a new DB context every time here, I, I ended up with 256 requests per second that it was able to process on my local machine here. And then we have a bunch of fun stats here in terms of throughput and and latency histograms. Kind of a neat little tool if you haven't seen it, Netling. Uh, no, I'll link I to it in the show notes. It's an open source project. And it's just nice and simple. There's also a command line version of it, so you can kind of script it and 
look at the results that way too. Um, okay, so let's run this again. I'll close this. I'm going to enable DB context pooling, which is really hard to do. You have to go here where you add the DB context and add the word pooling. Pool after. So adding DB context pool. And I'm going to run it. Everything should just run the same as it always did. There's really no difference there. I ran it without the debugger, so I can go back to Netling. And this one here, I'm going to run it again. In theory, it should be a little bit faster now because we've, we've uh, gotten rid of some of the overhead, I guess, of creating a DB context every time. And there you go, it was 293 requests per second instead of 256. Ooh. So it's not as dramatic of a difference as they showed in the, their demo at .NET Conf. Uh, it might not even be this big because I noticed Simon was holding very still for this. Yeah. List, so. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that everything worked out in your favor, you wanted to get worse. <laughs> but the, this doesn't seem on the surface like a whole lot of a difference, but on a sizable website, this could be, yeah. you can save yourself an entire server yeah. for the cost of four letters in your configuration yeah, file. Exactly. So now there are some caveats to this, and it's basically the reason why it's not enabled by default, is that for DB context pulling to work properly, they need to know how to reset the context to a default state. And okay. that's fine for most DB contexts that look like this, where we have nothing but, like we're just injecting DB context options, and we just have a, a set, a collection, or a number of DB sets here on the context. That's easy enough because it's all just entity framework things that they need to do. But if we were, for example, injecting a tenant ID into the context at uh, using DI or something, or in some way changing the state internally of the context here, they would have no way of knowing how to reset that. Mm -hmm. So, And I don't think they exposed any hooks for you to tie into the whole resetting part. Maybe that's going to come in a future version. Or maybe it's there and I'm just not aware of it. But um, that's something to be aware of, and that's a reason why you would maybe not use this in some situations. Yeah, that was exactly the question I was going to ask. So good job predicting that. Cool. That's it. That's all I had for DB context pooling. It's kind mm -hmm. of a neat feature. It's not, um, yeah, it, it can make a difference. So it, it's nice to have that option for sure. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, and thank you, kind viewers, for watching another episode of the ASP Net Monsters. Remember to like, comment, and share. We read all the comments, and if you read yours on air, we will send you a handy-dandy, performance-improving ASP.NET Monsters sticker. All right, so we'll see everybody next time. Bye.